Hello, everyone. Today is Thursday, June 21st, 2018, and this is the week in charts. Obviously, I want to thank all you guys and girls for attending. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. So what do we talk about? Well, obviously, current market conditions, your questions on trading. If you don't mind, since especially since we have such a focused topic this week, keep your questions on topic. And then towards the end of the show, when it open up for live charts, if you would like, you can ask any uh, other questions that you may have. Also, when we get to the, hold off on your stock picks until we get the live charts so they don't get buried and everything else. And also for your benefit, ask about a stock and then hit return and then ask about another one. Put the tickers in, too. I know quite a few tickles, tickers, tick, you try to say tickers, but not all of them. And that's also for your benefit to make sure I get them all. All right, so what are we talk about? Well, I find it fascinating that there's still a bull market in IPOs. When I went to my store this morning, I was looking at the IPO course to get the link, and I noticed that I put in 2015, 2016, and 2017, I guess I need to add 2018 to that. And that's been pretty amazing. Every time I think it's going to end, it goes a little further. I'm always nervous talking about it. I'm thinking I'm going to jinx them, but so far, so good. There's a disclaimer screen, as you know, you could lose money trading, or as I like to sum it up, all predictions are about the future, and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. That's a line I stole from Greg Morris. So there's still an I... Let me rewind that. <laughs> so there's still a bull market in IPOs. Now, for those of you who are wondering why... I use the sardine as my symbol. The reason dates back to the old story of the sardines, and I'm not going to go through a lot of details on that because I think most of you already know it. But in a nutshell, the soldiers or whoever, the stories is marked into all these different versions, but they were trading tens of sardines, and the sardines became very, very expensive, and the price just was skyrocketing in this big bubble. And Right around the time the bubble burst, somebody decided, well, you know what? I'm just going to have a real expensive lunch with these sardines. And when he opened them up, they were rotten. So he tracked down the guy who sold them to him and said, hey, these are rotten. And the guy says, you silly fool. Those are for trading, not eating. So that's the way I view IPOs. They are wonderful. They are a wonderful trading vehicle, but it can end badly. And that's why money management is crucial. And the other thing is, as Will Rogers once said, you want to buy stocks that go up. If they don't go up, don't buy them. Now, obviously, he was being tongue in cheek and being a little facetious here, but he is on to something. Something amazing that I discovered in IPOs many years ago is that you pretty much can just buy the ones that go up and avoid the ones that go down. I'm going to show you one pattern specifically to do that. But before we get into that, one thing that you need to know about IPOs is quite often the significant new high and or low is set during the first week of trading. Now, one thing that's also interesting that might be a little bit more fodder for research is quite often that first day will set the tone. But I would strongly urge you to it wait to wait for at least one week before looking to trade IPOs. There's not enough time in this forum today to get into all those details, but just trust me on that. Just take it as fact. You're much better off waiting that first week, especially as you'll see in a few minutes, than trying to just jump in right out of the gate. Now, as I said earlier, the significant high is often made within the first week of trading. In other words, the first five trading days. And also significant low is often made during that period. So obviously this is a hypothetical, but I'll show you plenty of examples in one second. So in this case, day three was the high. And day five was a significant low. Now let's take a look at a few examples here. Some of these 
come from a presentation I did last year, which may have been left over from a presentation from the year before, but I did throw a bunch of new examples in this morning. So there's quite a few current examples in here. But as you can see, in this particular case, the significant high, and in this case, the all-time high was set on day one. Here's another case where the significant high and likely the all-time high was set on day one. Now here's one where it was set on day two. So it looked pretty promising for this IPO. It came public, did really good first day. Second day began to take off. And then what happened? Well, it began to implode afterwards. Now here's one where it made it all the way to day four before making its high and then beginning to roll over. Now when Snapchat came public, Somebody's not seeing the screen. Let me just double check. It might be taking a while to catch up. Did it? Um, did we lose the screen? The good news is the recordings are. Let me unshare and share again. Okay, something got stuck. All right, it's waiting. Well, the good news is the. Recordings are more, much more robust. Let's just see what happens here. Sorry about that. Talk among yourselves. Well, this is a bummer. Well, I'm going to keep on and hopefully let's let's try this. Let's see. Let's try this. Still wait. Still looking at the fish. Okay. Let's do this. Let's change it. And then let's change it back. Wow, look at that. That's crazy. All right. Let's see what happens here. It works so good in rehearsal. Okay, so it's just, it looks like it, there's like a serious lag in it or something. Okay. Well, what I'll do is I'll just continue with the presentation and then. Well, this is going to really suck. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Took a break from the show and then cut back to this. You can do it. Yeah, let's try one more thing here. Let me uh, stop showing the screen all together. And then we'll start sharing again. Okay, so it is catching up. All right, let's see what's happened. It's just a tremendous amount of lag. Okay, I don't know what's going on, but let's do this. Let's just proceed like it's, it's, it's going to work. So when Snapchat came public, I wanted to come up with a way to possibly trade it without having to go through my entire IPO course. I wanted to show you guys something simple, and I got to thinking about it, and that's when I came up with the Dave Light Moving Average System, which I'll show you in just one second. And a lot of my discoveries come from teaching and that's why I love to teach so much and there's been a lot of research done on that when you teach something you often learn it yourself and this will be exhibit a but what I wanted to do was come up with something that was fairly I hate to use the word mechanical but for lack of a better word fairly mechanical and there is a little discretion in this and some of which I'll touch upon in just one second but fairly mechanical to show you that just following a silly little simple system could keep you out of trouble in something that's highly hyped and highly anticipated like snap and you'll notice that just getting back to the significant high that snapchat on day two looked pretty darn good to my amazement but that turned out to be the high 
for a very long time. And I don't think it succeeded at high just yet. Now, I say deja vu all over again because after Snapchat chat came out, not long afterwards, the Blue Apron stock came out, and it was yet another highly anticipated stock. And as you can see, on day one, the all-time high was set, and then it began to implode from there. Here's another example. Stock comes public, all-time high, and then begins to drop. And yet another one. And notice in both of those examples, it was on day one. Now here's a recent example, or fairly recent, I should say. This morning when I did my research, I went back 200 days to get relevant charts. So these are stocks that have come public less than a year ago. And here's yet another case where the significant high was made in the first week. Now, it did go slightly above that high, but as you'll see in just one second, by waiting for that close to also be above day one high, it would have kept you out of trouble in a case like this. Now, getting back to that simple system that I alluded to, Here's a very simple system that will keep you out of trouble. And this is what I used when I wrote about Snapchat when it first came out. I began messing around with a five-day moving average. And the reason I use a five-day moving average because is because it won't plot in telechart until day six. And I haven't experimented with it in Metastock just yet. But in Telechart, it won't plot until day six. So that would keep you out of that first week's worth of trading. Now, for those of you who have the IPO course, you know that there is a pattern that will go long at the close of day five. So if the stock comes public on Monday, there is a chance that on Friday at the close, you could actually buy then. But with this system, we're not going to look to trade until... There's at least one solid week behind us, and then day six could be your first buy signal. Now, you notice here I put the word often keep you out of trouble because nothing works all the time, obviously, and you will occasionally have a losing trade. Well, that's where the money management and discipline comes in. Now, there are a few caveats to this that can help you avoid certain signals and trade it in a little bit less mechanical Fashion. I'm going to touch upon some of that in a few minutes. So I needed a name for the system, and somebody came up with the word Dave Light for daylight, which I appreciate. So we're looking for Dave Light or daylight, where the low of the stock is above the five-day moving average. And we're going to go through quite a few examples in just one second. And rule number two is the stock must close at a new high. Now, the additional rule, or ancillary rule, I should say, is that if day one sets a new high for the first week of trading, it must also close above that high. So in other words, the stock must close at the greater of A, the high of day one, and B, the first week closing high. And that's going to make a lot more sense. So taking a look at a somewhat more recent example, you can see on that particular day, that would have been your buy. And if we zoom that chart in a little bit, we see we have day one, day two, day three, day four, and day five. Now, when we look at these five bars, we see that the close of day four set the new closing high for a week for the week. Now, we did not know that until when? Well, until the week was over, until day five. So anytime subsequent to day five, we're looking to buy at that five-day 
closing high. Now, in this particular case, day one, and I'm going to show you plenty of examples of this, day one was not greater than the five-day closing high, so we're going to use the five-day closing high as our trigger. And if we extend that line forward, you could see on this particular day we had what? We had Dave Light, meaning that the low was greater than the moving average, and the stock closed at a brand new high. So this is just enlarged of this right here. And you can see it took off for a while, and then it kind of meandered. And this is where being patient in money management comes into place. Notice that it never did go back to revisit. Let me see if I can draw a line more straighter. More straight, is that a word? Well, anyway, it's 14. So it never did come back to revisit that significant low, which is day two of the first week. Here's another example. You can see on day one, it made an all-time, made its high for the week. Let me rewind that. As you can see, on day one, it made its high for the week. And then you had some Dave light above the moving average. And you would buy on the close. Now, on this particular day, it was actually still touching the moving average. It was also a fairly narrow range, which we'll touch upon in just one second. But officially, you did not have a Dave light signal until this day here. Now, let's take a look at this example, day one, day two, day three, day four, day five. So your closing high was set when? Well, on the fifth day of trading. So you look to get long any day subsequent to that, that you have what? Dave light or daylight and a new closing high. And you're going to buy on the close. Now, that can be a little tricky buying on the close. But in a case like this, you know it's obviously going to close at a new closing high. And obviously, you will have to look at the market those few minutes right before the close. But the good news is if you did your scans and did your homework, then you know which stocks you're going to be looking at on the close. Now, there's not enough time to get into it today, but there are some things you can do if you do miss that trade on the close. Here's another example. One, two, three, four, five. So what day is the new closing high? It would be on day four. And then obviously that is much greater than the high of day one. So we look to get long the first close above that close when there's also daylight or daylight above the five-day moving average. And we're looking to buy that market again on the close. And the good thing is, because IPOs can be a little illiquid, you're going to have usually much better volume near the close. People are looking to get in and out, and you'll be able to execute the trade. Now, take a look at this particular chart here. Notice that day one high was greater than the five-day closing high for the week, okay? So let's take a look at this. This is day six down here, as you can see. So day five would be right here. This is our first week of trading. So what's the highest close? Well, day four would be your highest close. However, the high of day one was greater than that. Now, the reason I came up with this rule is, as I said earlier, the significant high can often be on the first day of trading. And what happens is the IPO comes public with a lot of euphoria, a lot of excitement. Sometimes it runs up a little bit. But then that euphoria quickly wanes or the bloom comes off the rose or insert your favorite metaphor here and then sometimes the stock comes right back in so again we're going to wait for dave light and a new closing high or the greater of the first day high in this particular case first day high was greater than a new closing high of what day four so your buy would be anytime it closes above 
this high. Now, right here, you say, well, Dave, did it close up with the high here? Well, it did. And that would actually trigger a different setup. But as far as this setup is concerned, we're also looking for that Dave light. So the great thing about this is it's not only a breakout characteristic, which I'm not a huge fan of breakouts when it comes to stocks in general. It can work longer term, but you're going to be wrong a lot. I talked to a breakout trader once, and he's wrong like 90% of the time. But that somewhere in that, I think it might have been 92% of the time, but somewhere in that 8 to 10%, he makes back all his money and then some. I can't trade a methodology like that. It's a little too hard for even me to trade something like that, even though I know eventually it's going to pay off. But the good news is two things. One, IPOs have a breakout characteristic. And there's many reasons for this. But let me just give you one. One is that everybody's happy. Who's ever owned the IPO, pre-IPO, post-IPO, they're happy. The shareholders are happy. Everybody's happy, happy, happy. So the breakout characteristic tends to work a little bit better. There's a lot of other reasons, and I don't want to back into too many of them, but one would be that the there's not a lot of players. You're not playing in a really crowded playing field just yet. You're a bit of a pioneer. And by the way, these patterns are also what I call pioneer patterns, meaning that you're getting in as early as possible without, of course, buying before they go public, which is a bad idea. So again, we're going to look at the greater of the first day high and the five-day closing high. In this particular case, the greater of those two, let's count our days, one, two, three, four, five. So your closing high would actually be here, but the greater of the two, the first day high to closing high, would be right here. Okay. So I wanted to show you this example because you would buy on a close here, but notice that it came back in and traded for a few weeks and actually went sideways to lower. Well, if you could stomach it, and the way you stomach it is you adjust your share size accordingly, and the range isn't too extreme. Now, in a minute, I'm going to touch upon the fact that you want to make sure you have a decent amount of range, but if the range isn't too extreme, then, as I said earlier, significant high or low, in this case, this is your significant low, is set during the first week of trading. So you could say, well, if it goes on to make new lows, I am wrong as a trend follower. You can put a stop down there and then sit tight. Now, it's going to be hard to trade this way, admittedly. But if you could do it, you'll catch enough IPOs, at least as long as this IPO bull market continues. That's a little caveat I threw in there, okay? You'll catch enough IPOs to make it all worthwhile. Now, here's one thing that's pretty cool. When the market gets iffy, I have found over the last several years, markets choppier, or headed lower, overall market, the IPOs often have this demarcation between the good ones and the bad ones. It often becomes much more obvious. In other words, you end up with a lot of ones that come public and go straight down and ones that come public and go straight up. And not a whole lot of in-between to mess around with. So you're going to have fewer setups, but you'll end up with better setups when that occurs. Now, here's one we're long on a secondary signal. We're long on a first pullback, which is another pattern altogether. But as you can see, the first day of trading set the five-day closing high. And again, we don't know until day six where we are in all this, or at least the close of day five, near the close. But you can see on day two, it made a new high for the week. Well, we're going to go with the greater of the first day closing high and the highest close for the week. Well, in this particular case, day one sets both. So even though this high is higher than this high, we're not worried about that because we're just worried about that first day. Because why? Well, because the significant high is often set on the first day of trading. 
And you can see we had a little Dave light in there. And we also had a new closing high. So your buy signal would have been on that particular day. Now what's fascinating and interesting is it would have sucked for a while, but this stock never did take out that first week's range, which also, again, the significant high or low is often set to first week and sometimes even on the first day. Now, here's an interesting example. You can see we had day one, day two, day three, day four, day five, and it closed at a new closing high. And then on this particular day, technically, it would have been a buy on the following day. Well, it didn't work out so hot. Now, I'm not trying to come up with a rule that will avoid all losing trades. That's a grail hunt. Early, early, early in my career in the mid-90s to late 90s when I was programming a lot of mechanical systems, I started trying to figure out systems that would eliminate losses. Well, what I didn't realize, all losses, what I didn't realize was I was doing a grail hunt, but in reverse. Instead of focusing on catching trends, I was trying to focus on avoiding the bad trades. What you have, you have to do a little bit of that, but it's very hard to do that mechanically, and you can't make up a rule for everything. My nephew just graduated in finance, and I'm trying to deprogram him to understand technical analysis and throw away those fundamentals. And I know I just said the F word. My apologies. And it's going to take a little bit on programming, although I did show him this IPO stuff, and he's getting pretty excited about it. So I'm kind of excited about him, a little light bulb going off in his head. Now, with that said, there is a bit of a discretionary rule I consider. An IPO should be hot. It should be volatile, okay? If it's not hot and volatile, then avoid it or wait for it to prove itself, wait for a secondary signal. By secondary signal, I mean, let's say an IPO comes public here and it's just kind of meandering around. Instead of trying to look to get long within that first week or so, let it prove itself. It begins to break out and then has a nice little orderly pullback or some of these other IPO patterns we like to trade, then by all means go after it. But as far as a pioneer signal, in other words, an early signal, early in its trading history, if the range is really tight, then you might want to wait for that secondary signal. In this particular case, we had a little bit more than a point range on this. When an $18, $19 stock, that's a pretty tight range. You'll see some of these IPOs have moved 30, 40, 50% or more in their first week worth of trading. So that's one of the caveats that I would toss out today. There's a few more that we don't have time to cover in this forum, but I just want to let you know there are a few little caveats in here. Now, here's another case. In this particular case, you can see that this stock was technically a buy. Day one, two, three, four, day five set the all-time high, okay? But notice that this range, once again, it was about a one-point range in a $20 stock. So that's not that much for an IPO. IPOs should have a lot of excitement to them. So in a case like this, as I said a second ago, instead of trying to get in here, even though it had a pretty good run in perfect hindsight, I would leave a stock like this alone and look for a secondary signal. Well, what do we have now? Well, now we have a pretty good range. And now we have a pretty good trend. So now it's begun to pull back. I would put this one on your radar. The symbol is PS. You're welcome. So, again, because this range is so tight, consider a secondary signal. What's a secondary signal? Well, a pullback would be one secondary signal in this particular case, maybe a TKO or something like that. Now, as I said last time I did a presentation on IPOs, what's pretty cool about the breakout characteristic and when they start making new highs with IPOs is that there is some long-term promise. So even with this simple little system, which could take 
a minimum of six days. You could be long at the end of the day six, remember? Even something like this, longer term, it does have promise. And by the way, a lot of this research many, many years ago, I came in one day and decided I would look at IPOs. And I looked at every IPO there was in the world going back many, many years. And I got to wondering, what would just happen if you bought them when they made new highs? And that's how I discovered a lot of these things, which took me a few years to turn into an IPO course. But in a case like this, it's like, okay, well, let's not buy this thing until it starts going up, making new highs. And you wouldn't actually have your buy signal for what's at about a year and change, which is interesting. Now, not that I would get that excited about a system like this. There's some other things you can do, such as maybe trade bow ties with these IPOs when they bottom out after an extended period of time after that significant high was set. And there's a few other transitional type of patterns that you might want to look at when they're trading at low levels. They do have a bit of a Phoenix characteristic to them, meaning that if they do die out on day one, if the market timing is bad, if the IPO was priced poorly or whatever the case may be, or the stock came public a little too early, sometimes they will implode like this and then the company gets its act together and then they begin to take off again. So you might look at something like a bow tie or some other transitional pattern when that occurs instead of waiting for this particular setup. But my point is that even though this is a short term made to get you in early, 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 it does show longer term promise. Here's another example. You can see this stock came public and didn't do a whole lot for one, two, three, four, months and change, and then finally broke out from its moving average, although you have to squint to see it, and closed at a new high. And here's yet another case. Your significant high was set when? On the first day of trading. And then it took two and a half months before A, it closed at a new all-time high, and and in combination was also above that first day high. If you squint your eyes and look carefully, you can see this day here was an all-time closing high, but based on our day one rule, it was not above this high of day one. Let me draw that better. It was not above this high of day one, okay? And you didn't have daylight, okay? So your buy would be here two and a half months later. Now, again, you can see yet another example. Where the closing high was here. And the high for the week was here. And then I forget why I put this one in here, but you can see that it did take a while to trigger when it made a new closing high, which would be, let me see what that would be. One, two, three, four, five. New closing high, I guess, was here. Oh, okay. This, this line should be extended backwards. So the new high was here. And it didn't take that out and have the daylight until here. So that's a month and a half later, six weeks later. And yet another example, I think this one might be a little bit more current than some of those other ones. You could see five days and then on day five, it made a new closing high for the week. And your buy was right here. Notice it died out a little bit after that buy. But what happened? Well, yes, it retraced, but it never did take out that first week's low. So you can adjust your share size accordingly. And one of my biggest problems, and my wife has pointed this out, and if you get married, she'll point out, your, your wife will point out a few things, but she's always saying, you know, you're right, but early. How do you solve for that? Well, I can't really solve for that. And I know that 
like in a big short, you know, that's the same thing. Michael is being is being wrong. He's being ripe and early. But one way to solve for it in IPOs is when you get in with these pioneer signals very early on, if you're willing to say, okay, I'm going to give this thing a really loose stop and I'm going to stop out if and only if it goes on to make new lows, that a lot of times you'll ride out some of these retracements before they really take off. The other thing I was recently talking to a client about, because we're long Billy, which I think we already covered. But with these IPOs, if you could ride out that first deep retracement, in fact, that's a pattern in and of itself. A lot of times these things can really take off. But this is where the majority of people get shaken out. And that's probably why that pattern actually works as a secondary pattern. So if you're taking profits and loosening up that stop, a lot of the money management is the same as it is in the core methodology. You're positioning yourself a longer term trend. Now, one thing we also were discussing is it will suck when that stock retraces and keeps on retracing and stops you out. You will give up a lot of those open profits. However, hopefully, those profits, even when stopped out, are still significant enough to make it all worthwhile. As a private trader, we do have an advantage to where we can allow some of those open profits to erode, as painful as it can be. If you read Jesse Livermore, he talks about times when he knew positions would go against them significantly, and he'd let them go against them a million dollars or so because he knew he had to stay with the position and he was right in staying with the position. So, yeah, drawdowns suck. But as a private trader, the good news is it, when I show some of this, it's interesting. When I talk to institutional type of people, hands start going up and they're like, well, we can't we can't let that draw down. We'd have to answer the clients. We, and they would ask me things like one in particular. And I'm not picking on this person, but one in particular is like, well, what am I telling my clients? And I didn't come back with a flippant answer, but I thought to myself, Tell your clients that you're doing the wrong thing by getting them out early and you're not making as much money as you could not make for them. This is where the advantage of the private trader comes in. We could do whatever the freak we want. And sometimes you have to be willing to give up a significant amount of those open profits in order to stay with the position. Now, I've given you a little system here and I've touched upon a lot of things with IPOs. There's a few things, obviously, that are missing as I alluded to earlier, it's going to be a wild ride, very often going to be a wild ride. I reached out to a client of mine who I know has some family members in, interested in trading, and I asked him, you know, I, I said, uh, I know your son's interested in trading. You think he might be interested in being a beta tester and learning some of this IPO stuff and the methodology and trading momentum stocks and all these other things. And he said, I talked to him and he, he knows how I trade, being his father, knows how his father trades. And he just didn't think that he could actually stomach it. And that's fine and that's okay. But I'm a big fan of volatility and the devil you know. I would much rather get into a, a more volatile stock and ride out the zigs and zags, knowing them in a more volatile stock, than to, get into, than to get into a less volatile stock and have some sort of surprise event occur. So as I preach with volatility, better the devil you know. We could talk for a long, long time of volatility. Volume is tricky in IPOs, in the IPO course. I don't know exactly how much time I spent on that, but it was a significant amount of time on gauging whether or not an IPO is liquid enough to trade. Sometimes it's pretty obvious and you don't really have to worry about it. But other times you have to look for individual bars to figure out is there enough volume to trade it. Range, as I touched upon earlier, can also be important, especially with these pioneer patterns. The initial pricing and the opening price can be tricky. There are some pre-IPO things and post-IPO things. But if that stock, if they price it too high and or the opening price is too high, as I said in the IPO course, if it's priced too high, it's going to die. And that often happens. 
Now, as I alluded to a minute ago, money management is crucial with these pioneer patterns. Again, if you can stomach the old lows, adjust your share size down accordingly, you're going to catch more and more trends in these IPOs. Now, there are some caveats, again, with the pioneer versus secondary signals. One of those that I touched upon earlier would be range. If you have very significant range, then you can go in and trade the pioneer signals. As simple as they are, they are a little tricky and take a little discipline to trade. In some cases, again, you want to wait for that secondary signal to occur, that first pullback, maybe that first deep retracement, and or some other secondary type of signals. Now, there are some alternatives for the buy at close for Pioneer Patterns. If you missed that close, you're not sitting there watching the stock, or dang, you missed it, there's a couple things you could do to still get long that IPO. There's also some common patterns to know of, and here are just a few of them. The dying to die, the flying to die, the dying to fly, the first pullback, first deep retracement. There's quite a few other patterns, and the better off the more you know these patterns, the better off you're going to be. Now, if you're interested in the full course, I have put it on sale. And all you have to do is there's no promo code or anything needed. And in addition to that, and I'll show you in just one second what I'm working on, I am launching a learning management system. That's going to be really cool. And I'll give you a year's access to the learning management system. And I know I'm a nerd, but I'm really excited about this. Just real quick, if you're interested in watching the first four videos for free of Trading Full Circle, you can go to this URL here, daylander.com slash two dash trade dash stocks dash successfully. Maybe one day I'll shorten that. Now, before we hop out into to the overall charts. Let me just show you what I'm talking about with the learning management system. And this is what I've been working on. And it's really cool if I say so myself. I have so much content and that's been the big challenge here is getting all this content into a usable form. As I've said, ad nauseum, Somebody once told me, you've got a lot of great content. Why do you hide it? Well, I'm no longer going to hide it. I've got it parsed into these courses. And as a member, you'll have access to all these courses. And also, with these premium courses, for instance, such as the IPO course we just talked about, obviously, you'll have access to all the member stuff because you're going to hear that after launch. So I'll give you... If it takes me another three months to launch it, you'll still have access a year after that. But you have the premium courses again, and then these are the member courses down here. Where was I going with that? Anyway, I've got all this information. I'm beginning to parse it out. Oh, I know where I was going with it. And one of the things that I'm up against is there's only one of me. And I've answered, I think what I wrote layman's in 2009 or 2008 whenever i did that book eight years ago whenever it was i had answered 30,000 emails and that number maybe has doubled since then and obviously there's only so much of me to go around and who knows i might get hit by a beer truck one day what's going to happen to you i think it's very important that all of this goes into our learning management system and obviously there's going to be a nominal cost for this but the good news is I'm able to track the progress. I had one guy email me for 10 years. He was a losing trader for 10 years. And finally, I thought this guy was mentally challenged, which is a polite way of putting it. And I said, just go in and read the first book again and then get back to him. And he says, well, I've been meaning to get that. So this was someone who obviously wasn't serious about their trading. And my ultimate goal with this would be, Every one of those 30,000 or 60,000 questions, whatever it is, would be answered in this. And then the ongoing, if you go back to the homepage on this, the ongoing webinars 
would answer any unanswered questions. So anyway, I'm, I'm a nerd, but I'm pretty excited about this. And I think there's something very special here, especially with the learning management system. And you're going to have to actually, I know it doesn't sounds like, oh, great, Dave, that sounds exciting. But you actually have to pass a little test before you allow, before you're allowed to go on to the next module. But that's a really good thing because if you are, if you grasp the material, then your life's going to get a lot easier in the actual markets. All right. If you don't take small losses, you will take large losses. Yeah, I agree. Eventually. Yeah, eventually it will catch up to you. And the other thing, too, is, and I know I pick on the mean reversion guys a lot, but I see it happen over and over, and I have some I have some bad experience there myself, as I often say, to drink minimum on those stories. But I'll see people do things that work for a long, long time, make a little, make a little, make a little, make a little, blow up. And trust me, psychologically, that is really, really, really hard to do. Okay, I'm going to open it up for live charts. It looks like there's still some lag in here. So unfortunately, worst case scenario, you'll have to look at the recording to be able to see what we talked about. But I'm going to start going through the overall market. And we'll work our way down to your stock picks. All right, first of all, S&P 500. S&P 500 is the most disappointing of all markets all indices, I should say, at least, the indices that I follow, those being the Russell, the NASDAQ, and obviously the S&P for the most part. But you can see we sort of took off in here. I like the way it was persistently moving higher, and then we've kind of pulled back a little bit. Well, this is not the end of the world, but I'd feel a heck of a lot better if we took out this recent high in here. Now, let's take a look at the NASDAQ. NASDAQ looks a lot better. As you can see, yesterday it broke out. And now it's beginning to come back in a little bit in here. So we had a new all-time closing high in the NASDAQ. And I know day ain't over yet. And we have come off the lows today. But hopefully it'll catch back up by the end of the day and go on to make new highs. But so far it looks pretty, it looks pretty good. Now let's take a look at the... Russell 2000, all-time highs yesterday, certainly a good thing. Sold off fairly hard this morning, but so far off of its worst levels. Now, if you've been following along in the service, and maybe even the market in a minute, I know it's been a while since I've done them, the market in a minute, that is. I've been saying, I sure wish we would just break out and not look back for a while. Well, step one is done. So even if we have a fairly significant correction in the Russell 2000, I think we're going to be okay. Now, as I often preach in the service, check back often. Now, one thing that I'm witnessing, and it's no big shocker, but if you look at the S&P 500, which tends to be more big cap issues, energies, banks, metals and mining, stocks like that, for the most part, you can see that energy's not doing so hot, metals and mining not doing so hot, banks not doing that great, okay? Down here towards these new multi-month lows. Insurance and some other financials, same sort of issue happening there, just not really doing that good. In fact, insurance is down here. What at multi-month lows right now if it were to close there? Now, some areas, like the drugs, have been improving as of late. Drugs overall tend to be a big cap area, but they have been improving as of late. But like the peas, beginning to kind of, Stall out a little bit of the pre recent pre peaks in here, he tried to say. Retail, another area that has been improving as of late. In fact, in spite of a weak market, today it's actually doing pretty good and not too far from these multi-year, it might be all-time highs. Yeah, at least on a closing basis, closing in on all-time highs. As you would expect, most, and most being a keyword in that sentence, but most areas, technology-related, are doing pretty good, like the NASDAQ itself. 
couple exceptions in there. Semiconductors are just having a hard time getting out of this stupid range I've been in. But for the most part, hardware, software, especially software, looking pretty good to hear. Most technology, as you drill down in these sectors, doing okay. And then just on the flip side, just one more to show you. When you get back to these big cap issues, such as defense, you can see really not doing that good in here. Okay. I know there's a lag today, but if you guys want to start asking me about individual stocks, we'll pull them up and then maybe you'll just remember what I say and then in a few minutes the chart will come up and you'll see it. Also, if there's any questions about anything I covered so far, feel free to ask them now or any questions outside of what we covered, feel free to do it. Quite a bunch today. I wonder if there's a lag in the uh, audio too. Okay. Donald wants to know about AVLR. I've never heard of it. AVLR X. Oh, two people want to know about it. Okay. Well, this is this is what is this? An IPO. Day one, day two, day three, day four, day five. Well, technically, I have a pattern that could be long on day five, but there's a caveat. The caveat is it's greater than a certain price, so we would not use that system. So on day six, which would be Friday, I guess, one, two, three, four, five, technically you could be long the stock tomorrow if it has its low above what? The five-day moving average. And the close is at a new closing high. So let's day one, day two, day three, day four, day five. So let's see where this close ends up today. And it could actually be a buy going in to Friday. Friday's close. My only caveat is, or my only issue is, I'm not as excited about a $50-something IPO as I would be a lower-priced IPO. doesn't mean that this one won't work. I'm just a little bit more excited about a lower-priced IPO. And I don't really have a specific reason for that other than it's possible that there's a lot of euphoria about this stock already, which is reflected in this higher price, whereas I'd much rather get it to uh, a Billy, B-I-L-I, I'm long surf right now. That's another one, S-U-R-F. I'd much rather get into something at a lower price and wait for that excitement to catch on as opposed to something where there's some of that excitement already in it. But yes, as of tomorrow, it could be a buy. And it's not going to be a buy on a close today because the price is is too high based on, I know what you're hinting at. You're hinting at the, the buy at B system. No, it's not going to be technically not a buy at B but the moving average setup, the daylight moving average, could actually trigger a buy tomorrow. And that's one reason why, or part of my development of that, it's like I came up with a buy at B pattern, and then I decided, well, the only problem with that, I'm still missing some really good stocks. I'm avoiding some stinkers, but I'm still missing some really good ones. Well, by having that Dave light characteristic in there, you're also – programming in, so to speak, a little bit of acceleration. So it has to break away from that moving average. By the way, the Dave Light comes from the 220 EMA breakout system. The theory there of Dave Light or Daylight goes all the way back to the mid-90s when I published an article in Stocks and Commodities for Trading Yen Futures. Good Lord, I'm dating myself. Got to be a joke in there somewhere. <laughs> if I could date myself, I better get lucky. All right, VRCA, biotech, VRCA. Okay, another IPO. One, two, three, four. So we can't do anything until, well, with the Dave Light system, we can't do anything until day six. But this one should be on your radar. One, two, three. Oh, sorry, five. One, two, three, four. Five, okay? Well, the high was set on day one, okay? So until this closes above 22, we're not going to go after it, 
Okay. But yeah, put that on your radar. Absolutely. All right. Keep them coming. Everybody's shy today. Don't make me sing. Fill in the time. <laughs> INSP. Here we go. INSP. Okay. All right. What do we have? Well, first thing jumps out of me here was you had a really nice secondary pattern. First little deep retracement in this, and then it took off from there. Now, it's not a buy now because you've already had your pioneer pattern. This would be pioneer right here. This would be your secondary pattern, the first deep retracement, and this is just now in a trend, okay? So, yeah, put that on your momentum list, but not a buy at this particular juncture. All right, Don was talking about SQ. And, of course, wants to talk about Ford. Well, this was actually the example I was using of riding out deeper trace, but in in momentum issues in general, not just IPOs. And you could see that if you just look at the price now and you go all the way back to 2016, it looks like it was almost straight up if you squint your eyes. However, there's some pretty serious drawdowns in between. And... It would be difficult, obviously, to ride out some of these, but longer term, in my next life, I want to figure out how to get into these SQs and stay in them without being obstinate and ride out some of these retracements. But getting back to the IPOs, you will have some fairly deep retracements guaranteed in the IPOs. It's just a matter of riding through those. Oh, I know what I wanted to mention earlier. The IPO co course is in process of being converted to the new learning management system, which you'll have access to. But what you're getting is both the old one and the one that's being converted to the learning management system. And then when the time comes, I'm going to redo the IPO course and every other course for that matter and put them in the chroma key uh, system. And the other thing too is the you'll get the raw files and I'm editing the files and putting them into the new system getting out the uhs and the spaces and some of the things that didn't make sense. And I'm adding in some uh, annotations to help make it a lot more clearer. And I'm also adding in things that I have discovered since. And it's just slight little nuances, but sometimes those nuances could be very important. And anyway, you have lifetime access to the course with any course that I do. So SQ, not set up right now, maybe on a pullback. Ford, I'm not going to like, I can tell you right now. I'm not a big fan of stocks that are electrocardiograms. As a general statement, I don't like big cap stocks. I do occasionally like to short big cap stocks. I'm not in the mood to do any shorting right now because I'm encouraged by the upward movement in the market. But if you told me I had to be both long and short, I would be looking to short something like the big, thick banks. Why? Well, look at them in high levels. They're just beginning to implode. I'll give you an example, not a bank, but a financial. And I hope they don't remove me from being an affiliate for them, but I am an affiliate for interactive brokers. But look at this beautiful little first thrust down. I bet it's also a... Yeah, it's a bow tie, too. It's a pretty little pattern, right? Dave, did you short it? No, I didn't short it because I'm not going to try to play both ends against the middle in this particular market. I'm going to give the market the benefit of the doubt, and I'm going to err on the side of being more long than short, at least for now. As long as the Nasdaq's at or near new highs, as long as the Russell 2000 is at or near new highs, I'm going to avoid shorting anything. But this is a stock that I would... Be interested in shorting a little bit thicker. Eh, not that thick, though. Not as thick as I thought it was, but a little bit thicker stock. Okay. What's that? Is that 7 million? Yeah, well, 700, you know, close to a million at least on average volume. And something that's well known and established as opposed to 
something that's more inefficient, like an I, not an IPO, but like a biotech or something. Now, getting back to Ford, Ford is just kind of all over the place. It's a Jackie Mason stock. It's up, it's down, it's up, it's down. Or somebody pointed out, I used to call them Katy Perry stocks. They're up, then they're down. All right, how about on SP? We talked about that one. AA for a short. Oh, okay. Well, AA is going to be um, a metals and mining stock, but you can see it's a big, thick stock. Now, that's, that's a big, thick stock. $39 million, is that right? On average, or just some ridiculous number. It's kind of all over the place. If you, if I had to go long or short, yeah, I think a possible short. But two things. One, let's not short anything at this juncture. Two, let's stay away from these stocks that are wide, loose, and all over the place, such as Exhibit A would be Ford. Okay. M-O-R. Somebody asked me if Don really exists. I'm just being silly each week. No, Don exists. <laughs> and he loves Ford. All right. This is an IPO. And you can see it came public, and it really didn't have much range. So there's nothing in this for me to get excited about. However, now it's beginning to wake up. So I would have ignored a first or a primary, what do you call it, pioneer signal. I would have ignored a pioneer signal. But, yes, this one's on my watch list. Let's just see what happens. If it continues to break out, then pulls back. You can see the volume's a little thin, so that would be another caveat on that one to be careful with. But, yeah. Put it on your watch list. CBLK is going to be another ID IPO. You guys are doing your homework. Very proud of you. Yeah, this looks pretty good. I think this is actually on my Landry list coming into today. Now, it's a little crazy. If it drops much further, I would ignore it. But let's just throw in the moving average for S and Gs. And as you can see, I've got an open window somewhere. i got to find... As you can see, your Dave light would have been on this day here. And I think this was one of our examples we used earlier. Okay. And your closing high. Okay. High was set on what? Day one. So you got to close above that and you have to clear the moving average, which didn't happen until this day here, if memory serves. So now you're in a secondary pattern. And the secondary pattern is going to be a first deep retracement. If it drops back to this range, all bets are off. But, yeah, it looks pretty good. It's on the, it's, I had forgotten it was on the Landry list for today, so I should have talked about it. So my apologies. But, yeah, it looks pretty good. I don't think any harm is done because it doesn't look like it's going to trigger. Yeah, Dropbox is another one that did get its act together and begin to take off in here. And I think it's interesting the way it's taken off and kind of pulled back. I would use, in this one and the one we were just talking about, I would use a very liberal entry just in case it continues to implode, then no capital would be put into harm's way. Spot, another IPO. I like that you guys are on topic today. That's awesome. Now, this is one I actually meant to talk about. Even though it would have been technically, I think, let me put the moving average in. I meant to talk about this when I didn't get around to getting the chart together, but I'm glad you brought it up. Even though technically on this particular day it would have been a buy, I did not go after it just because of this crazy first day of trading, and it really didn't take out the high that significantly, okay? I would much rather take a look at a possible secondary signal in here or even a second pioneer signal, meaning a re-trigger of this would be a lot better way to trade that. So there are a few caveats, and as you get a little ex more experience with these and a little bit more common sense, and when you finish the course, you'll pick up on a lot of those things, and, of course, you can ask me any questions afterwards. But I wouldn't get too excited about this particular day, and I didn't get too excited about this particular day, just because it was such an extreme wide range ball on the first day. Also, it's priced so high. I think, yes, there's potential here. But I would much rather be, again, not to beat the dead horse, in a lower-priced IPO that's on the cusp of being discovered. OLED is a short. Who's the, who's the bear in here? Uh, well, okay, when I'm looking to short something, I prefer 
And again, you have to, I say again, because I, I, I say this often, you have to take it within context of the overall market. So if the overall market is, is at or near new highs, or even if it's at higher levels, like the S&P at fairly high levels, and you want to short something, short something like the banks that are just beginning to break down, insurance stocks just beginning to break down, defense stocks just beginning to break down. And as a general statement, try to catch stocks coming off of major, major highs, ideally all-time highs. Don't pick a top, but wait for what? A bow tie or some sort of transitional pattern to occur, which suggests but not guarantee, obviously, but suggest the stock has topped out and then look to do some shorting. So uh, once they get at such low levels, I mean, this stock has already lost how much? Roughly, what, 60% of its value for a, a fairly big cap stock. That's It's not that it can't go lower, but I would leave it alone now, okay? Oh, you shorted it weeks ago. Shorted and mentioned it weeks ago. Okay, congratulations. So you talk in your position. No problem with that. I talk my position sometime too. Okay, yeah, all right, congratulations. Yeah, HUIA we just talked about in the um, IPO stuff, okay? Uh, yeah, it's been in a setup again, but this is getting kind of a little crazy in here, okay? If you're long, stay long. Close your eyes. Make sure you have a stop in, very liberal. If you're not long, let's let it retrace, see how far it goes down, and then maybe look to play that first deep retracement. So, yeah, that could that's definitely worth putting on your watch list. But it's going to take um, – what's a good way of putting it? It's going to take some cojones on that one, huh? All right, any more? Don't be shy. Okay, I'll give it one more minute. Go on once, go on twice. While well, we're at an impasse, obviously I want to thank everybody for coming. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. Anything unanswered, send me a question, Dave at DaveLandry.com. Check out the IPO course. It's good stuff. I say so myself. I've actually, it's the first course I've done that cost me money. By that, it actually had people quit the trading service because they were doing so well in IPOs. I'm not kidding on that. But that's that's exciting and frustrating all at once. All right. Well, thanks again, everyone. Everybody, if we don't talk to you now and then, everybody have a great weekend. And then I guess hopefully we'll see all you guys again next Thursday and girls. Thank you so much.